just saying. Yeah, so uh, we, we often think in our, when we first learned about chemistry that everything is in what we term called molecules, but some things are just chemical formulas, things that are associated tightly together. There's, they're bonded together, but not in the same way like water is. So I'm just going to add that more formula at the end. Okay. So the subscript following the symbol means the number of atoms that for, that are in. I look words out. Oh, thanks. The molecular formula. Now, if you have parentheses. Right, it's kind of like math. Everything in the parentheses gets multiplied by that subscript. So, if you have parentheses, the subscript applies to everything in the parentheses. And I'm not going to write the whole word out. So, if you look at like barium nitrate. How many bariums are in the formula? There's one, right? So that if there's a one of them, we don't put the subscript one. So we have one barium. And then how many nitrogens are there? Two. two. Because this two goes to the oxygen, right? So it doesn't go to this. So if you go two, there's one of those. So there's two nitrogens. And then, and the oxygens, that's what we have four of. The subscript on the oxygen, right, applies only to the oxygen. So real quickly, why don't you figure out how many, right, carbons and how many oxygens are in CO2, and then go down and do CH3OH, and then there's another one that's down here, the CA, and then in parentheses, NO3, two. Let's write those out real quick. You could just put the letter and the element symbol and the number of each. And just be careful on, on capitalizations because like calcium, uppercase, lowercase, CA, and, and it's read differently if it's all uppercase. So don't just make it smaller, try to use the correct case symbol. And I'll just start to separate the letters because all right. So the carbons we have what? One and oxygens, two. two. Carbons for this one, one. one. Hydrogens, four. four. All right, so you got to add them all up. But in 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 writing chemical formulas for like this class, a lot of times all the each symbol is grouped together. But in other chemistry classes, we often write elements separate from each other. Like there's hydrogen in the beginning and hydrogen in the end because of the structure of the molecule. It's giving somebody more information about what it is. So you have to be a little bit careful when you go through. And then the oxygens, there's only one of them, right? And then for calcium nitrate, one, right? Nitrogens, two, and oxygens, six. Cool. Any questions? And move on. Okay, so um, chemists, scientists in general classify matter uh, lots of different ways. Okay, so we have pure substances and then we have mixtures. So that's like the whole universe except for energy, right? Pure substances and mixtures. A pure substance is one kind of uh, atom or one kind of molecule that makes it up. There's not two kinds of anything, okay? So one kind of atom or molecule 
that makes up the substance, right? So substance is a very generic term. So like if you have water, right, and like it's pure, quote unquote, it's just H2O. There's, even though there's two hydrogens for every oxygen, there's two elements in there, they're traveling around as molecules of H2O. So that would be a pure substance. Um, air, would air be a pure substance? What's in air? Oxygen, what else? Nitrogen. So already, because you've listed two substances, that's a mixture. Okay. So mixtures are of two types. So pure mixtures are two or more pure substances. So this, all right, a pure substance is like one kind of atom or molecule, and a mixture is multiple kinds. So like air would be an example of a mixture. And pure substance would be H2O. And air, you know, primarily is actually nitrogen. It's about 70% nitrogen, and the rest of it is oxygen and a few other weird gases, you know. I think, or 80%, 80%, and the rest of it's oxygen. Yeah, so nitrogen, oxygen. Anybody know the third most abundant? This is kind of weird because you never think about it. Argon, yeah. Argon is on the far right hand side. You know what helium is, right? Like you inhale helium and your voice gets really high or you float balloons with it. So helium's the top one on the far right. That's part of the noble gases. They're not very reactive and so they're kind of special and they end up just because of the way nature is, they end up all by themselves on the end of the periodic table. And then there's neon. Where have you heard neon before? Neon lights, like if you see those brightly colored red lights, right, they glow, and they're not made out of like LEDs, but they have these glass tubes. Those are filled with neon, okay? And then there's argon, which actually is, if they make argon lights too, those are the blue ones. But that's the third most abundant element in the air that you're breathing, okay? It's not reactive. So like hydrogen, oxygen, a little bit so nitrogen, the hydrogen and oxygen are pretty reactive. And so they end up being in lots of other things by reacting with other things. Argon doesn't react with anything. So it just kind of floats around in our atmosphere. It's created by like radiation and all that. Anyways, that's a long story. But um, yeah, it's cool. I'll tell you stories about it later. So the third most abundant element is argon. Okay, now, so we have mixtures, two or more pure substances. They're homogeneous. So homogeneous, what does that sound like? All one thing, All one thing right? So, but it's, it's the same through out. Uh, you, it's uniform, that's another way. Because it really was all one thing, that'd be a pure substance. Right? It's uniform. So no matter where you sample in it, it's always the same. So like if you put a little salt in water and you stir it around, right, that's homogeneous. You could drink a little bit of the water at the top and a little bit of water at the bottom and get the same saltiness. The same thing with sugar, you can make it a homogeneous right, mixture. Okay. There's a funny word, <clears throat> hopefully, you guys know this word. Uh, it's a funny word that we associate with homogeneous solution, uh, homogeneous mixtures, and that's solutions. So when you have a homogeneous mixture, we call it a solution. So like air, like in this room, even though it's a mixture, it's homogeneous because it's not like you're going to walk into the corner of the room and suddenly like there's no oxygen and then you pass out, right? It's the same amount of oxygen in the entire room. For every meter cubed of air, there's going to be the same amount of oxygen atoms all throughout the room. Now, um, heterogeneous, okay. Um, yeah, yes. Heterogeneous is basically not the same throughout, right? It's not uniform.
And so we're going to classify lots of different things as like pure substance, homogeneous, heterogeneous. So like mercury and thermometer, like when you, you guys probably aren't familiar with mercury thermometers like I am, but mercury in a thermometer, right? That's a pure substance. It's just mercury that's in there, right? And then exhale there. Uh, you inhale, and then you breathe in, right? And what do you exhale? Carbon dioxide, because you know your metabolism. Breathe in the oxygen, you use that to create energy, and then the CO two is what you expel out. That's homogeneous or heterogeneous? You think? Yeah, most of the time gases make homogeneous mixtures. So if it's a gas, it's usually homogeneous. And then it's a mixture. Right. Chicken noodle soup. Like, is that homogeneous? No, because we've got noodles and chicken and you know all that kind of so this is uh het heterogeneous. And then like sugar. What is sugar? Any idea? Uh, it's not a mixture, all right? It's just a pure substance. So pure a sugar is actually uh, C, let's see, C12H22O11. This is like table sugar. Like when you hear the word sugar, a lot of times you're associating it with c 6 h well, O6, and then we call this like glucose, right? That's what glucose is. This is sucrose. Uh, let's see, sucrose. I think, I think it's just one C. Yeah, it looks okay. Table sugar. And that actually is a chemical compound made from fructose and glucose together, and you, you bond them together, and then you end up getting... Um, uh, sucrose. So that's table sugar. But these are just, these are pure substances, right? So if you look at the pictures on the right, right which one of those pictures on the right is a pure substance and which ones on the right are mixtures? So what those are supposed to represent, the dark ones, those are oxygens, and the light ones are either carbon or hydrogen. And this, represents H2. So your book likes, lots of people like these pictures. You can't actually like look at a microscope and see them, but they like to make these pictures to sort of represent what things look like. And it's not, Totally inaccurate. But. And then this one would be, for example, O2. That. Is that a mixture or a pure substance? It's a mixture because there's like H2 and O2 in it, right? So this would be a mixture. What about B? This was B, or this was C, that's B. Mixture of pure substance. Take a guess at A, what about A? Pure. And you know that because it has like the white and the two dark, right? And that's actually supposed to be like gray or black and red, but you know, it's a black and white picture. Yeah. So that's a pure substance because there's one kind of molecule inside, right? The little diagram here. These are atoms, individual atoms, but there's two kinds of atoms in there, right? So that's a mixture. 
Any questions? Like pure stuff, just make sure everything's all right. So we'll move on. Okay. So um, we like to classify matter um, by its state. Okay, so we, we just classified whether or not it's pure substance or mixture. That's just one way of looking at things. And, that, and, and scientists do this like all kinds of ways. Um, we also like to classify matter uh, according to its state. So the three physical states that matter is what we call them solid, liquid, and gas. So then there's actually other states of matter that they've discovered since solid, liquid, and gas. And so I have a little note for those things for those who are curious at the end. Right? But each type of matter, each state of matter, right, has its own characteristics. And we classify things according to that. So solids, right, in terms of shape, they have their own shape. They have their own shape, really, just because the molecules or atoms that make it up are strongly attracted to each other. And so because they're so strongly attracted to each other, once they're stuck together, they don't move. So generally speaking, solids, we, we characterize uh, by the particles being very close together and then also stuck together. And that keeps them from moving. Now, now liquids, a little bit tricky to define the shape of a liquid, right? The, the liquid in like free space has its own shape, but typically like on Earth, it conforms to its container. It'll, like a cup, right? You put water in it. It sits in the bottom of the cup and then fills it up, right? So we would say conforms to a container. I'll just abbreviate. I mean, you guys have seen those pictures in space where they make a, like a bubble of water. Have you seen those? It makes a perfect sphere. It has its own shape if there's no gravity. You don't need something to hold it. It just holds itself together. And most liquids will do that. A, a gas, right, it fills the, whatever container you put it in. So in, in other words, it fills it. So what it means is the, the atoms or molecules of the gas will spread out and fill the entire container. So kind of a funny uh, example, I don't know, it's maybe I shouldn't record these things, but funny examples. Uh, we went to Kings Canyon, and, and you know what happens when you go to high elevation? Right? Like if you have gas, like not like car gas, but like intestinal gas, the pressure is lower, and so it tends to come out, right? And you're in a car, <laughs> it fills the container. Like you can't get away from it, right? I mean, that's kind of weird to think about. So you open up the windows. A lot of times it's somebody that's asleep and they don't even know, but yeah, it fills the container. All right. <laughs> it didn't really matter how big of a car you have either, does it? Like, it just kind of fills the whole thing. No. Anyways, in terms of, um, uh, let me think about what I want to say. Let's do compressibility. Um, Yeah, let's do uh, let's do atoms. Let's do atom spacing first. Okay, so um, atoms, the atoms, right, of a solid, they're 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 close together and they're stuck together, right? So atom spacings are very close. They're touching actually, right? Now, for a gas, what do you think the spacing of atoms is? It's defined by the container, and, it, and it's pretty far apart as a result, okay? So, the, so it's really defined by the container. So these are pretty spread out, just like I wrote at the top. 
And, and that's, that's a function of how strongly attracted the molecules are to each other. If they're strongly attracted to each other, they're most likely to be a solid. And if they're not strongly attracted to, to each other, they're most likely to be a gas. It turns out everything has some energy, and so that energy causes them to move apart. Okay? Everything has energy, so that energy makes them spread out. Now, a liquid, you kind of have to throw the dice, right? But you know, like, if you have, like, an ice cube, right, it has a certain mass. And if you melt it, it has a certain mass. And the volume's about the same. And so it turns out for liquids, there's enough attraction to keep them close together. They're almost the same as a liquid or a solid, I mean, but they're spread, but, but they can move about. So they're close together. but not stuck. So their attractions are weak and they can move around each other. Just like in this, well, okay, so this is what happens in the classroom. You kind of, guys, I'm gonna guess, provided you persist in the class, you're gonna sit in the same place every day. <laughs> it's just the way it works. I don't know why class. So you're like the solid, but if every day you came in and you sat in a different place, right, and you moved around during class, you'd be more like the liquid. Just ability to move around. You would individually be the atoms and molecules, right, and you could move around each other. That would make you a liquid, okay? Now, compressibility, you know what that means? That's how, how, how much you can squeeze it together, right? So if you're looking at compressibility, which do you think can be compressed the most? It would be the gas because they have the most space in between. So gases tend to be very compressible. That's why like shock absorbers, they have gas-filled shock absorbers instead of liquid-filled shock absorbers. If you have a liquid-filled shock absorber, it doesn't compress at all. Okay. So shock absorbers, things like that, gases are very compressible. So most compressible. And solids generally are the least compressible. And liquids are very similar to solids in terms of their compressibility. If you've ever done a belly flop, right? You know the water hurts when you hit it. It's, it's almost as hard as the ground if you hit it fast enough. So, yeah, so it's similar to the solid. And gases are the most compressible because they have the most space between. Space between, I'll just put that. Most space between the atoms. Or molecules. You know, and I'm looking at volume, I'm thinking, nah, I don't think there's anything I can say there. So I'm just gonna leave it for now. I might think of what I really wanted to say, but I forgot. Okay, so when we're talking about solids, there's two kinds, and that's the closest stuff together. There's two kinds of solids. There's, there's what we call uh, crystalline solids, and then there's amorphous solids, okay? So crystalline solids, right, are, when you look at the atoms or the molecules that make them up, it looks very much, many of them, especially the metals, look like when you go to the grocery store and you see the display of oranges, right? Okay, who's never been to the grocery store and seen the display of oranges? You've all seen it, right? You got it like, okay. Okay, so when you go to the grocery store, you see that display of oranges, you know how they take that nice little pattern? Like, you'll, you'll look at it, and next time you go, maybe you should look at it. I'd seem to go way too often. It's going to look like this. All right, and you see how that pattern works is the spheres, right, which are the atoms or the oranges, take up a space, and then the other ones just sort of fit as close as they can. And they actually make a hexagonal pattern. It's kind of an interesting thing. Like you can draw a hexagon in here like this. Right? And that pattern repeats itself over and over and over again. 
and then you put a layer on top of it, right? And those fit in the little spaces created. They take three oranges, you put it together, and there's a little divot in the middle of the three oranges. Those will fit right there. And then that pattern, because the bottom layer is regular, the top layer is regular as well, and it goes all the way through, okay? So, crystalline substances have a regular repeating structure. That's what that means. Okay. And it turns out some property, if it's a crystalline solid, it has some unique properties. Like when you melt it, the whole thing melts at one temperature. So for example, if you take ice and you melt it, what's the melting point of ice? What temperature does ice melt at? 32 Fahrenheit, or the easy one to remember, zero degrees Celsius, okay? So like ice, like, okay, we have a Yeti. There's a lot of people about these Yetis, right? Why are they so good? They hold the temperature for like forever. So you take a piece of ice, so it turns out even with the lid off, it works great. I just use one as a cup and I only got one because I was a coach for the baseball team, anyway, the football team, and uh, one of those two. And so they gave me one, I'm like, oh, because I don't actually buy those things myself. And you can put ice in it and water in it and set it by your sink. All night long, it has water and ice in it, even if you don't put the lid on it. So it's really well insulated, right? The temperature is the temperature of the melting ice. So it doesn't get colder, right? But it stays at zero degrees Celsius until all the ice is gone. It works out really well because it's insulated. So, right, crystalline substances have very unique properties, right? They have something called a melting point for water. H2O solid, right? That melting point is zero degrees Celsius. but other solids will have different melting points. And one of the characteristics that we use to identify the purity of a substance is to measure at what temperature it melts. Turns out for every um, like 1% impurity, the temperature changes by usually around two or three degrees Celsius. So you can actually measure the purity of water by seeing at what temperature it melts. And for the most part, drinking water is so pure it all melts at zero degrees Celsius. Then there's things that are amorphous, okay? So amorphous solids are things like glass or plastic, rubber, things like that. When you heat up a, um, plastic, right, what happens to it first before it, before it like completely gets liquidy? It's hot, and then what happens to how hard it is? It gets softer, right? Ice doesn't do that. As it's melting, it stays, the part that's solid, right, is still just as hard as when it started melting, okay? So, so like a block of ice, right, if you let half of it melt and then you hit it to your head, it would be just as hard as if you had the block of ice and hit your head with it the first time. Okay, when you got it. It's hard to say, but you take a piece of plastic, right? And if it's cold, it's really hard, but then as you heat it up, it just gets soft, right? And, and it's, it's because they don't have an amorphous solid, doesn't have this regular repeating pattern that you have in a crystalline solid. So for amorphous solids, um, they have an irregular arrangement of atoms. And they tend to like get soft when you heat them up. So like butter, right? You warm it up and it gets soft. That's an amorphous solid. Uh, fats are the same way. Fats and butters are very closely related to each other. Let's see what else does this. Plastics, a wax, like candles, those are all amorphous solids. 
They don't have a crystalline structure. Glass, as hard as glass is, is also amorphous because as you heat it up, it gets, like you can melt glass and like make like, have you seen the guy at the fair that makes the unicorns and stuff, right? No? No. I don't go to the fair anymore. Maybe he's not there anymore. There should be a guy there and he would make like angels and unicorns out of colored glass. You couldn't do that if you heated the glass up and it just turned to liquid. It was really a crystalline solid. You just would end up with this puddle of glass. Right? But he, he was able to shape it into different things because it gets soft and then he can work with it. Okay. Liquids, right? Particles are close together, but they're not stuck. And they have enough energy to move around each other. And then I'm going to just move on through some of this. Gases have a lot of space between the molecules and are not strongly attracted to each other. Now, let me ask you this. One of the uh, properties that we talk about is density. And density takes the mass, right? We talked about this last week, and divides it by the volume. What's more dense? Think about this. What's more dense, the, a liquid or, uh, or a gas? So if I had a container, right? Think about a container of a liquid. And think about a container of a gas, right? Same size container, which would weigh more? Liquid, right? Why does it weigh more? Has more mass in it, more, more molecules in it, right? So for the same size container, a container of a liquid versus a container of a gas, a liquid weigh, it would weigh a lot more. So liquids tend to be more dense. So these are dense, right? density is high and then for gases because they don't weigh a lot the mass divided by the volume the densities will be low and you you kind of can interpret that because there's a lot of space between the atoms and the atoms is what makes up the mass since there's a lot of space the large volume and not a lot of mass, it has a low density. Uh, gases tend to be about a thousand times less dense than a liquid. Okay. So if I have one liter of uh, water, right, one liter of water weighs a thousand grams. One liter of air, now you don't think about this, weighs about a gram. Like the stuff that's going in your nose, coming out, you're inhaling about a liter and exhaling about a liter every time. You're like a gram of air in and a gram of air out. What do you think about solids? Density? High or low? High, right? Because there's not any space between the atoms. So there's a lot of mass in a smaller volume. So this is going to be higher density. Now, How do you think the densities of solids and liquids compare? We think a solid would be higher, lower, about the same. Yeah, so you want to say higher, and it's true in general. Solids are more dense than their liquids because they're stuck together and they're just actually a little bit closer together. The only weird substance that I know of, and I know a lot of substance, the only weird substance I know is water. Water is the only substance where the solid is actually less dense than the liquid. And you know this because it floats, right? A substance with lower density will float on top of a substance that's higher density. So ice cubes float and they'll go to the top. If you take an ice cube and you put it in pure alcohol, pure alcohol density is much lower than water and it'll sink to the bottom. 
And then if you layer a like water and an alcohol, right, and you drop an ice cube into it, it goes down through the alcohol and then stops when it hits the water. It will just float. It looks like it's floating in between inside the glass. Okay. So I'm going to make that little note because that's one of those things you're you kind of you kind of know, but I want to make sure you know it, right? A substance. that is less dense will float on a substance that is of higher density. And then there's these two other states of matter that you can just read about. Like if you want to look them up, Google them. There's like zillions of pages of information on those things, but they're kind of cool. Plasma is the sun. Like the sun is a different state of matter, it turns out. It's not solid liquid or gas. And then there's these Bose-Einstein condensates, which Einstein predicted would exist. And then, you know, 40 years, 50 years went by, and then they actually decided, yeah, they do exist. So it's one of those things. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, so um, one other thing that I wanted to talk about is, uh, is how the state of matter relates to energy. Okay. I call it a hierarchy, right? Just means something's higher and something's lower. So the hierarchy of states. So if you take a solid, right? and you put energy into it, like an ice cube. Think about an ice cube. Take a solid and you put energy into it. What's it gonna do? Melt, right? And if you take a liquid and you put energy into it, what does it eventually do? It boil or evaporate, right? So think about what this means, because there's something called the, the law of conservation of energy, and we'll talk about it later, and we're also gonna talk about it just a little bit now. Conservation of energy says the energy uh, can, can never be destroyed in a process. So the amount of energy you start with and the amount of energy you end with has to be the same. So if I have a solid and I put energy into it and it becomes a liquid, this, right? That means a liquid is a higher energy state than a solid is. So if you wanted to melt an ice cube, you have to put heat energy into it to get to that higher state of energy that's a liquid. And it, you take a liquid and you want to get to the next higher energy state, that would be a gas, you put energy into it. So a gas would be above all of this. Now, these processes then absorb energy as we go up. So when you put an ice cube on your hand, right, what happens to your hand? It gets cold, right? Because the ice cube, in order to go from the solid to the liquid state, needs to absorb energy from something. And you're the most readily available source of energy is to have that ice cube in your hand. We call these processes that absorb energy endothermic. I have a, actually a big space in here down below. So I'm gonna actually recreate this diagram without all the words around it below. So, but, but go ahead and write all this here. Okay. okay. Um, that's where I'll do the naming of the transitions between states. So if you go the other way, like if you go from gas to liquid, what has to be true about energy since energy is conserved? You're going from a high energy state to a lower energy state, right? 
Well, it loses energy, right? Doesn't actually maybe necessarily temperature change, but it has to give energy out, right? You have to release energy. So when you go down like this, right? This side releases energy. And any process that ends up releasing energy, right? We call it exothermic. So now think about this, if, if ice melting on your hand, right, makes your hand cold because it's endothermic, what do exothermic processes do? Make it hot, right? They make the environment warmer. They lose energy, but they make the stuff around them get hot. So endothermic processes make the surroundings, call it that, cold, and then for exothermic, they get hot. So loses energy, right? Has to release it to its surroundings, it gets hot. So you know like when you're cooking spaghetti and you grab the lid of the pot and you lift it up and then all of a sudden the steam hits your arm, right? And it gets really hot. The hot is because there's water vapor, H2O gas, and it condenses into a liquid. So you can feel the liquid on your arm, but the heat that actually causes the burn comes from the, the liquid going from the gas state, right, going to the liquid state. So from the water going from the gas to the liquid state. That release of energy is actually what ends up burning you from the steam. If it never condensed on your skin, like if you had skin where water molecules couldn't stick, Right, you wouldn't get burned. There's not that much heat energy in the gas. Most of the energy comes from it going from between the states. Okay. So we're going to name these states. Um, and we're going to be talking about properties, and I'm going to draw the states underneath. Uh, and like uh, I usually do, I'll take a break in like 10 minutes. I don't like to go like three hours straight. I know there's some people that can do it, um, but I like to drink coffee, you know, those things. Good, yeah, we'll take like a 15 minute break or All right, so, so here, here's the deal. <clears throat> Their changes are either physical or chemical. Those are the two types of changes. And we're gonna talk about properties too. They're, Properties are also either physical or chemical properties, okay? So when you have a physical change, right, you're changing the physical state, solid, liquid, or gas. But you can also change the shape. It's not just restricted to states of matter like we think about, but it could also be like uh, particle size. Like, so I took, if you have a diamond ring, and I took a hammer and smashed it up, would still be a diamond, just in a different physical shape, right? That would be a physical change. Right, the thing about physical changes is that when they happen, right, you're still talking about the same substance. Physical changes occur without a change of substance or formula. So physical, right, changes, Occur without changing the substance. So, like when you know you have ice, that's water, right? It's H two O. Then it's liquid. It's still H two O. So that's a physical change. It goes from the solid to the liquid state. Whoa! I didn't mean to zoom that. My finger was in two places at one time. All right. So we have solid, liquid, and gas. And now what I'm going to do is name all the physical changes that occur or can occur. 
So solid, we're going to always put at the bottom. That's the way I like to put it. Because in my head, I always think of that as the lowest energy state. I'm going to put liquid in the middle. I'll put gas at the top. Okay. And the phase changes. They have names. Whether you're going up or going down. So I'm going to draw arrows going up and down like this. Okay. And then I'm going to save some space because we're going to also draw, because you can go directly from the gas to the solid. You don't have to do the liquid in between, right? We think about it that way, but you don't have to. And you know that because like if, if you take an ice cold glass out of the freezer and you pull it out, you know what I'm talking about? What happens to the outside of the glass? You, it's not just condensate. If you pull it straight out of the freezer, you get frost on it, right? That's gas state. That's weirdly enough the water that's in your air condensing onto your glass, right? If you think about how gross that actually is, like all the things that are in your air, or like you're, you're in a bar and they do that, it's just like, I don't know. Anyways, sorry, probably ruined that for a lot of you. Okay, so solid to liquid, we know this one. What is it? What do we call it? Melting, yeah? That's the typical name for it. Solid to liquid is typically called melting. Um, there is a weird scientific term for it. So I'm gonna teach you what it is called fusion. And we use that in several places for physical changes and also for nuclear reactions. So like completely different context, okay? But we call it fusion because if you take a bunch of ice cubes and you heat them till they start melting, they just sort of become one big puddle. It looks like they're fusing together. A lot of solids, as they melt, will fuse together and become a single thing. Okay, so we call it fusion. <coughs> then liquid to gas, we have a couple of terms for that, but primarily we're gonna stick with vaporization. But um, evaporation falls under that category, okay? So going up, we kind of know those terms. Going down, we know most of the terms too. If you go from a liquid to a solid, what do you call it? Like water to ice, what do you call that? Freezing, Freezing yeah, you know that one. And there's not like another term, I don't think. There might be, I don't know, like not off the top of my head anyways. And then uh, gas to liquid, you know that one too probably. You may not think of it right now, but I think you know the term. Condensation, yeah. So those are the names for those terms. All the ones on the right, are exothermic, all the ones on the left are endothermic, just like it was before. And then there's this one, gas, right? I don't know a better way to do it, one well, like that. That actually has a name you may not have heard, it's called deposition. Like, you know, the court, <laughs> like taking a deposition, I don't know why it's that, but it's called deposition, same word. I guess because you're depositing. So water molecules in the air hit a cold surface and lose all their energy and they get stuck in the solid state. Okay. The opposite process, you've probably heard, but maybe don't realize that's what it means. I'm gonna go like this. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm gonna go the other way out here. This is called sublimation. So deposition would, would be, we talk about frost on a glass, right? Because you guys don't have lots of like experience with those ones. And then sublimation, 
All right, your common experience with sublimation is dry ice. Why do they call it dry ice? Because it never makes the liquid. Right? It goes straight from the solid to the gas. And dry ice is just CO2, carbon dioxide solid, going to CO2 gas. And so it doesn't go to the liquid state in between. Oh, yeah, and then I did this thing. Sorry. I put this. That's an S and that's a G to represent the state. So it's CO2 in the solid state going to CO2 in the gas state. So we designate states okay, by putting them in parentheses after the substance. So we have solid, right? We have liquid. We have gas, and there's actually one other, and I'm going to throw it in here. I'm just going to write it to the side here. There's solid, liquid, and then there's gas, right? And then there's AQ, uh, and there's actually more of these, but AQ means in water, aqueous. And um, any questions on that? This is like a lot of information. Some of it's familiar, some of it's new. Just learn it all, okay? Easy for me to say. All right. Now, uh, when you have physical property, uh, physical changes, you can measure physical properties on the physical change. So when something goes, and I'm gonna go back up to that chart I just drew and put more information in there. But when something goes from the solid to the liquid state, we call that the melting point. Okay, it turns out the melting point and the freezing point for a pure substance are the same. So for example, water, when it melts, it melts at zero degrees Celsius. When it freezes, it freezes at zero degrees Celsius. The only difference is whether or not you're taking energy and putting it in or taking energy out. Okay. So when you're talking about melting, right, we're talking about melting point. This is a physical property, so I'm going to use a different color. And freezing point. And for pure substances, those two things are the same. When we're talking about vaporization, the temperature at which something boils is called its boiling point. We have a relatively strict definition of a boiling point that we'll talk about later. But it, it, in essence, you know, it's when you can form bubbles in a liquid. So you heat it up enough, and all of a sudden bubbles started forming, like rapidly, that's the boiling point. If you take water and you heat it on your stove, and it gets to the boiling point, and you stick a thermometer into it, it's 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. You can leave it boiling there for 20 minutes, and as long as there's still water, and you stick a thermometer in there, it's still going to be 212 or 100 degrees Celsius always going to be the same. It doesn't get hotter, it just stays that temperature, as long as it's boiling. So I, I, I mean, partly because I don't like wasting time and partly because I'm cheap, partly because I want to conserve water. I usually get a big pot of water when I'm cooking at home and I fill it and I get it to boil and I know it's 100 degrees Celsius, I want to cook stuff in it, right? So I have vegetables and I put them in a basket and I throw them in the boiling water and they boil and they cook and I pull the basket, just like you do a deep fryer. Put it in the water, you pull it out, you get the next vegetable, you stick it in there because it's already boiling, right? You stick the next vegetable in there. For each one, it's like, you know, five minutes. Pull it out, dump it. And then the last thing that usually goes in there is pasta, which is I just, because I have a lot of kids, you throw pasta in there and you just want to spill them up. Put the pasta in there, same water, 
I don't tell my kids that they're eating water that vegetables cooked in. They don't care. They just eat it, right? But it's always, I know it's 100 degrees Celsius, right? It's the same temperature that whole time. And so I'm not wasting time by reheating the water to the boiling point every single time. All right. So for, for water, these are two numbers you have to remember. The boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. It can condense at any temperature lower than that. So we don't have like a condensation temperature, but as long as the temperature is lower than 100 degrees Celsius, it will condense. If it's above 100 degrees Celsius, it won't, okay? Now, melting point or freezing point, that's zero degrees Celsius. And we say one atmosphere, that's just part of the definition I'll talk about later. That's the pressure of the air. Turns out air pressure affects what temperature these things happen at a little bit, especially the boiling point. Okay. Pause. 15 minute break, find some coffee or something. Like here, here, here's a dam. Water like this. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna do this. Put a little fish in there. Right. And then they take the water. And so like the Kings River, this would be Pine Flat Dam, right? And then Kings River down below, right? This is the amount of energy that's stored. That amount. It's that that weight of the water at the top pushing down, right? That is a potential energy because if they don't let it out right it's just stored behind the dam when they let it out what they do is it goes through turbines or turbines and we have electric electric electricity generated right so electric generators so they generate electricity from that stored energy but you could you could also right tie something to this on a pulley and then it would drop down to here, right? And then you could take the spinning of the pulley and create electricity from that too. But this is kind of not the, as good as that because you have to actually move this up, right? <clears throat> we just let rain fill up the dam and snow fill up the dam and then we take advantage of that and collect all that electricity basically free. But how much energy is stored? Well, you can go from here to here, but it's not gonna go past the ground, right? You can go from the top of the dam to the bottom of the dam, but you can't go further down than that and collect more energy. So basically that's potential energy, it's stored energy, right? I always refer to my kids as kinetic energy, and then I'm like potential energy, right? So I'll sit on the couch and tell them to go do things. Yeah. Turns out, and you don't think about it this way, but like when you put gas in your car, right, you're filling it with potential energy. Because when you hit the gas pedal, you can move your car, right? Turns out chemical, chemicals store potential energy. So I'm going to write this real quick, C4H10 gas um, plus um, O2 gas makes 4CO2 gas plus, uh, let's see, 5H2O, so let's see, how does that work out? Uh, I'm going to cheat here, and I'm going to call this nine halves oxygen. That'll, that'll kind of work out. I'll show you that later. I just wanted to make sure it was balanced, because it bugs me when it's not balanced. Um, so when we're talking about, like, stored energy, like butane, you can run a car off butane. You can run it off natural gas. You can run a lot of things off gas that, like, not gasoline gas. When you think about the fact that, when you burn something, you get carbon dioxide and water, and you get energy, that energy was the stored energy. That was the potential energy. So when we think about like chemicals like this, 
they're actually, in terms of energy, they're not on the same energy. The products of the reaction, that's these guys, are actually lower in energy, right? Because we get that energy out and we use it for things. But all chemical reactions store some sort of energy or use up energy as they happen. And then we talked about conservation of energy. You can't destroy or create energy in a chemical process. It turns out you can do that in a nuclear process, but in a chemical process, you can't create or destroy energy. It's all there from the very beginning. Okay, so we'll stop there. We're gonna deal with math next time. What we're gonna do now is pull up the pre-lab, which... All right, so uh, you guys okay with the first one? The pre lab question calculate the, I gotta get this flipped around. Density of liquid. You guys get that okay? If you didn't, I'm just gonna move. If you did, if you all did, I'm just gonna move past it. If you didn't, you should say something. What about this one? Calculate the density of a rod of metal, all right? With a mass of 196.41 grams, a diameter of 2.10 centimeters and a height of 7.5 centimeters. Volume cylinder equals that. Remember the radius is half the length of diameter. You guys get that okay? How do you calculate the volume, all right? What's the equation gonna look like? It's pi, right? R squared times H, and so that's going to be 3.14159. I remember that because of a cheer. Like sine, sine, cosine, sine, 3.14149. Sorry. <laughs> now you'll remember it. Sine, sine, cosine, sine, 3.14159. It just sticks in my head. People are always like, why do you remember so many digits? And I'm like, it's almost embarrassing to tell them. I learned this cheer for, for pi, and it's never left my head. So the radius, right, is 2.10 divided by 2 squared. Or you could just divide it, right, times h, which is 7.55 centimeters so let me do this real quick i forgot to put centimeters in here and i forgot to put centimeters here like that so you're going to end up with units that are cm cubed all right so i expect you to see the units in all your calculations <clears throat> and then we have to do sig figs right so um for 2.10 how many sig figs three, right? So when you square a number, you're just multiplying it times itself. So this answer should have, this has three sig figs in it. This has three. So your answer will have three sig figs. You don't round. You just give me the number and mark the sig fig. So somebody tell me what they got for that number. What is it? 26.1. What's the next digit? No, your calculator. Five, zero. One five zero. Yeah. Okay. So three sig figs is there. So we'll mark it because we're going to use it in the next calculation. Now somebody else get a different number. You got a different number. Say something. Okay. So density is going to be equal to mass divided by volume. Right? M over V. So I have. 196.41 grams divided by and then 26.150 centimeters cubed and this has three sig figs in it so we're doing division again right so the top number actually and this is usually the case for mass you usually have a ton of sig figs you have five sig figs in that top number in the bottom number, even though I wrote a bunch of digits, I really only have three because that goes back to the previous calculation. Like that. 
So your answer when you do division should have three. Okay. And again, you notice I didn't round. I'm only going to round after I get the density. Only, and it's a, it's a single problem. So you only round once in that problem. <clears throat> I don't know what you get. I'm assuming it's close to 9.23, but I don't know. I don't have my key. I have a key, but I don't have it up. So I don't know what it is. Let me do it. A couple of you should do it because if one of you does it and it's wrong, then you're all going to lose points. It's about 7.51. Mm. 7.51. Any more digits? Zero eight. Okay, so eight, nine, blah, 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 blah. Okay, good. Units are grams per centimeter cubed. So three sig bigs, so you have three sig bigs in here. That's going to end up being 7.51 grams per centimeter cubed, and that's your final answer with that. Let me put a box around it so I can find it, that kind of stuff. And always write the unrounded number and then round it. Like write out what your calculator tells you and then round the number down. So that's the kind of work I expect to see. Like for a pre-lab and for homework and stuff, write out all the units. Okay, so we're going to do percent error, right? The, the accepted, I didn't realize it was that far off. I can't even remember what the answers, but um, the accepted density of this metal is 9.23 right, grams per centimeter cubed. So I'm going to do accepted 9.23 grams per centimeter cubed minus 7.51. And you know, since I'm doing another calculation, I'm just going to go back to that the unrounded one, grams per centimeter cubed. That's the experimental one. That's the one you figured out from your data, okay? Not the one that you looked up in Wikipedia or whatever. And then it has this on it. What does that mean, the bars? Absolute value, plus or minus, you just throw it all away, keep the positive, okay? So when you come up to me and say, I got a negative, I'm like, just throw it away. <laughs> it's okay. I just want to know how far away it is, how far off it is. Divided by the accepted 9.23 grams per centimeter cubed, like that. And then times 100. And that will give you percent. So that's you know, what we're calculating. Now, I just want to show you a couple of things on this, because you know, math can be maddening at times. But here, right, there's actually no units. It all cancels out. Because okay? the ones at the top get canceled by the one at the bottom. You could factor it out if you want to. I'm not going to. You could factor the units out and cancel it, and it looks a lot cleaner, but that's what happens. So you'll get a percent error. It looks like it's pretty big, actually. I'll calculate it. Oh, I don't want a function table. Okay. So 9.23 minus 7.51089. And then I'm going to get this 1.71911 divided by 9.23. And the top number has three sig figs. The bottom number has three sig figs, like that. Oops, I did the wrong calculation. Nice. That number divided by 9.23 times 100. That ends up being 
uh, with three sig figs, so 18.6%. So that's the pre-lab. There's one of these per experiment usually, so do the pre-lab ahead of time. It's going to be up, the experiments are up there all semester, so like the week before, like the schedule, you can see it. Look at the pre-lab and then ask me questions if you have questions and then we can work through those things, okay? Um, and again, like I hear on weekends usually, and I have office hours during the week, right? That's in my syllabus. But if you can't make it in and you want to ask questions, you can still get on using Zoom, right? Did I post? I don't remember if I posted the video for how to do Zoom. Okay, okay. Because yeah, yeah. You have to that okay. So, like, if you have questions, like you leave today, and I have office hours uh, today. I think they're in here. Um, I'll just because it's Tuesday, I'll be on Zoom while I'm in office hours. So like you go home and start working on homework, which is kind of what you should be doing. I know it's hard, you go to lecture, and then you should go home and do the homework for that day. Um, and you have questions, just get on Zoom or text me, right? I gave you my cell phone number. I've already had one or two people text me. 